Welcome to the Spot On Insurance Podcast, brought to you by Insurance Licensing Services of America, ILSA. This is Arlene Tavares. And this is Ted Tavares, coming to you from Puerto Rico. In this episode, we'll be getting insight from one of the top regulatory attorneys in our industry. But before we begin, remember to click on the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And now here's our host, Doug Foresta. Welcome and thank you for joining me. This is Doug Foresta. Today with me is Joel Levitin. He is from Stinson Leonard Street, LLP. He's an intellectual property attorney focusing on brand protection, copyright, comparative advertising, and technology agreements. Joel, welcome. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And I know today we're going to talk about how to protect and properly use brands and other intellectual property considerations. So the the first question that I want to ask you is about the different types of intellectual property. Can you explain for our audience a little bit of some of the types of intellectual property that exist? Yes, absolutely. So generally, there are five types of intellectual property. I'll run through them uh, real quickly. The first is patents, and patents are inventions, and they're very technical in nature. So they would uh, involve uh, mechanical uh, inventions or electrical engineering or medical devices. Really, we're talking about the type of protection that applies to uh, typically a a tangible product and the way that product is made or is used. Uh, So very technical in nature. Those are patents. And to have a patent, you actually have to get a patent from the the United States government. They issue a patent, and that, that becomes then your patent right. Copyrights are the rights that apply to works of art, and they are creative in nature. So... Uh, they protect creative expression, like uh, there's copyright protection in books, there's copyright protection in movies and video games. But that copyright protection also applies to all sorts of materials used in the business world, like presentations and brochures and websites. All those things have copyright protection. And copyright protection exists immediately upon creation. As soon as uh, one of these copyrighted uh, materials or works is created, copyright exists and there are benefits to registering your copyright, but you don't need to uh, register your copyright to have copyright protection in it. So therefore, it it differs in patents where the government is actually giving you something. I didn't realize that. So, uh, you know, people often say, oh, I, I, you know, I finished, I finished this, whatever work it is, my book, my, right, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, I have to, now I have to copyright it. What you're saying is it's actually already copywritten once you complete it. That's absolutely right. It's, the copyright protection exists upon creation. You don't have to register your copyrights, but there are benefits to doing so. But the, the, the fundamental intellectual property right exists as soon as the work is created. Thank you. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. So the next type of intellectual property are trademarks, and trademarks are, are brand names. We call them source identifiers. It can be a logo. It can be the name of your company. It can be a color scheme. It really can be anything that you see or hear, and it identifies the source of the product. It can be uh, something like uh, the Coca-Cola, the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle. That shape is uh, is actually a, a trademark because you look at that shape and you know this is a Coca-Cola product. So it's really anything that identifies source. Most conventionally, they are company names and brand names and, and logos. Uh, the next type of intellectual property protection is trade secrets. And a trade secret is Any piece of information that uh, you as a business keep secret, you keep it confidential, and because of its confidential nature, it provides your business an economic advantage. You know something that someone else doesn't know, and therefore you can gain an economic advantage out of that. Uh, To have a trade secret, really the key is making sure it is is a secret. If you ever disclose it to people, they have to be subject to non-disclosure agreements, and it really is sort of your duty as the owner of this potential trade secret is to make sure it kind of stays uh, under the hood. Uh, The last type I'll mention is called the right of publicity, and this is a right that all individuals have to control the commercial use of their own name and image. So it's that right that prevents someone from taking someone's picture and putting it up on a billboard for an advertisement uh, without their permission. That's called the right of publicity. So I think an example of this is like if, if I was to say I'm better than my competitor and my competitor is someone who is well known, like the to use the example of I'm better than Geico, right? Or mm-hmm. if I were to use that, is would that fall into what you're talking about? 
So in that situation, I, I'm better than Geico. The party that's using that's saying that would be using Geico's uh, trademark. That wouldn't be a right of publicity issue. Right of publicity is a personal issue. So really, the, uh, you can't use a picture of me without uh, my permission. Okay. Uh, okay. That, that's a little different than using someone else's trademark. Okay, thank right you. Right of publicity is a, is a personal right. Personal right, got it. Okay. So those are the types of intellectual property. Can you say a little bit more, too, about copyright more generally and, and how it applies to some of the copyright issues that businesses will run into? Yes, a- a- absolutely. So copyright, as I, as I said, applies to, to creative works, and those works really can come and arise in a, in a variety of contexts. It could be a website. A website would be protected by copyright. It can be software. It could be software that you use to run your business. It could be software that you develop for a, uh, a client or a customer. It can be a brochure. It can be a PowerPoint presentation. It can be a mobile application. It's really anything that contains uh, creative content. It can be a newspaper article. It can be a blog. All those things, they have text and they have pictures. All those things have copyright protection. And as we mentioned, they have copyright protection immediately upon creation. You don't need to go to the government and ask for permission to, to have copyright protection. You, you, you automatically own it. In the business setting, one issue that often comes up is, well, who owns it? That's a big issue. People often assume that uh, you know if I hire somebody to do something, if I pay them, if I pay them $1,000 to create some materials for me, that I own the copyrights in those materials. And that's actually, that, that, that's not the case. It's, it's just the opposite. The way copyright works is it's the, the creator that owns those, those copyrights. The one exception to that is in the employer-employee context. An employer will always own the copyrighted works created by the employee. But absent that, if the hiring party wants to own what is being created, then there needs to be a written document that says the hiring party uh, owns the copyrights in the, in the works that are created. Spot on Insurance is sponsored by ILSA, Insurance Licensing Services of America, America's premier licensing and regulatory compliance experts. To learn more about ILSA and the services they provide, visit ilsainc.com. Have you seen situations like that? I, that's really interesting because if I'm a business, I hire someone to create a website with the creative material in it, and they turn around and say, well, that's mine. So I, with, without a written agreement, then it basically it is theirs. Is that, that's basically what you're saying, right? That's absolutely right. And yes, I've seen it. Yes, it's, uh, it would be the developer's website. And where, where this comes to be an issue is not necessarily so much in the first launch of the website because everybody's on the same page. Right. Uh, it, 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 it comes later when you want to make revisions to that. And the reason is when you own the copyright, you have the exclusive right to make copies of the copyrighted work and you have the exclusive right to uh, revise it, adapt it. We call them derivative works to create derivative works of the copyrighted work. So on day one, when you have your website and it's great and the developer puts it up for you, everybody's on the same page, but then you want to maybe go to another vendor to make changes to it. And to make those changes, you need to own the copyrights. And that's where sometimes developers or advertising agencies or people who create collateral material could potentially, and we do see this, they kind of hold you hostage a little bit. And right. they say, well, you can't, you can't go to another vendor because we own the copyrights and to make changes, you need to work through us. Now, that, that should be addressed in the front end and there should be an agreement that says actually the hiring party is going to own the copyright. The other area we see this is in like master services agreements that will say, you know, you're going to do this these five things for me. You're going to hire a vendor to do these five things for me. And then the results of those five projects are governed by this master service agreement, but then, and which typically would address ownership of intellectual property. But then the client says, Hey, can you do one more thing for me? Can you, can you, can you, can you just do this in addition to those five other things? And that's not covered by the master services agreement. And so then the ownership of that will not be governed by a written document. And then the creating party, the vendor in that instance, would own that extra project. Wow. So this is really important. This is really important things for a business to to think about. I, I wanted to ask you as well, in terms of copyright, would that also apply to, for example, let's say if you created a, a guide, you know, like a, um, a, a compilation of information for consumers? 
Yeah, absolutely. Anything that contains more than you know a handful of text will have copyright protection in it. So it can be a compilation of, of different information uh, about an industry, about industry practices, about best practices. Those, those all would have copyright protection. Often the issue is, well, who owns it and can I compile it? Do I have permission to make this compilation because someone else might own the rights? But Certainly, uh, something like a, a guide for customers or a guide for industry participants would be protected by copyright. What are some other unique areas of copyright that you see uh, that apply to business? Well, we see a lot of activity in the software area, hiring vendors to create or update software systems and ownership of those updates. For example, a company might want you know, an off-the-shelf piece of software to do something specific and customized for its business. And uh, there's often negotiations around who owns those customizations and what the vendor, the creator of the software, can do with them with respect to other competitors in the field. So software is a, is a, is a big area for copyrights and, and ownership issues. One area that really doesn't get a lot of attention is that copyright actually can apply to ratings or scores And that's not necessarily uh, what a lot of copyright lawyers think of because we think of copyright protection applying to these creative works of expression. But there are some cases that have recognized the way uh, a score is derived. So uh, there's one case involving health scores, and it rated various healthcare providers. And it wasn't just a mathematical formula that was used. It wasn't that, you know, at this particular hospital, they had, this was their infection rate. That wouldn't be protectable because that's just a mathematical formula. But it was a score that was derived from various subjective criteria and business judgment. And it's that subjective criteria and the business judgment that is the creative content. And if all those things are put into a calculation and that comes up with a unique score based on this professional business judgment and not really a mathematical formula, then that can be uh, protectable. And we've seen that apply, like I said, in the health grades context. It's applied to ratings for professional sports players. Those have held to be copyrightable. And that's important because if you are in the business of sort of creating these grades or these ratings and you do it in such a way where copyright protection might apply, then you can license those to other people to post on their website or to post in their materials. Very interesting. Thank you. So, uh, so f- that's copyright. What about trademarks? How does a trademark different from a copyright? Sure. So your, your trademark is your name. Uh, it's your brand. It's really your identity. And because it identifies you, your trademark is really a symbol of your reputation. Uh, you think about Apple. The Apple is a trademark. It actually conjures up an image in people's mind. Uh, and you think about the trademark IBM, that might have sort of a different reputation than Apple. So we, we, we have these brands and they actually have, they resonate with consumers in one way or the other. So it really becomes a symbol of your reputation. In the United States, uh, sort of like copyrights and that you don't need the, the, the government to grant it to you, in the United States, trademark rights are developed based on using it. So I open up a business, I hang my shingle out uh, uh, on my door, and I'm engaged in commercial activity. As soon as I do that, I actually have trademark rights. Now, we also do have a federal trademark registration system, and that's it's actually it's a very beneficial system, but you don't need to register your trademarks with the, with the United States Patent and Trademark Office to have trademark rights. It's a use-based system. We recognize common law trademark rights. So as soon as I'm doing business uh, under a certain name, I have developed uh, trademark rights in that name. Are there benefits, though, to... I assume there must be benefits, though, beyond, you know, to registering your trademark. Yes, absolutely. There are, there are benefits. Benefits include uh, having nationwide rights. So if I, uh, I'm located in Minneapolis, Minnesota, if I'm operating a business in Minneapolis and I don't have customers outside of uh, the Twin Cities region, then my trademark rights are geographically limited to where I'm actually operating. With a federal registration, you, with a federal trademark registration, you, um, receive nationwide trademark rights. So if I'm operating in Minnesota today, but I want to operate in California tomorrow, if I have my federal trademark registration, I'm allowed to do that. So it allows for companies to expand geographically because they already have the uh, they already have their national trademark rights. Got it. You're also, if you have a federal trademark registration, if you ever need to enforce it uh, in court or if you're ever in a dispute with somebody, 
it's very helpful to have that trademark registration issued from the government. The court will consider you to have, uh, they'll presume that you have valid trademark rights. But sort of beyond that sort of legal technical issue, it just is more meaningful and impactful to show somebody that you own something. You know, here's my certificate from the government that says this is my trademark uh, versus just saying it. So it really can be more persuasive. So what then do do business owners need to be mindful of when it comes to trademarks? What are some things that they need to be thinking about? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Really, before you select a trademark and start using it, uh, the best practice is to conduct a trademark search, either hire a lawyer to conduct a trademark search or at a minimum do some searching uh, yourself because you don't want to, you don't, you don't want, you don't want to um, step into a problem. So because people have trademark rights and they register their trademarks, uh, you want to make sure that when you're selecting a trademark that you're not selecting an infringing one. Trademark rights are typically, except for very, very famous trademarks, they're typically limited to the product or service with which they're used. So that's why we have uh, coexisting trademarks. So we have a Delta Airlines and we have uh, Delta Faucets. Yeah, Delta Those Dental. Coexist. There's like a million, uh, th- like a lot of Deltas, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and so that's typically you. Ha- your trademark rights are limited to the area in which you in which you do business. So just because there's Delta Airlines doesn't mean that I can't use Delta for for faucets. And the exception is that to that is when you have a very very famous brand, you know Coca Cola for example. You pretty much can't use Coca Cola for for anything. It, it, right. it, it crosses all product all product categories because that would be characterized as a famous trademark. But most trademarks, I mean, realistically are not are not famous and they are limited to the the product or service area in which they're in which they're used. So it's very important to make sure that. Uh, it's clear to use before you start, before you create materials that include your trademark, before you create your new sign, before you create your new business card, uh, make sure that uh, it's clear to use. So th- this is where, too, can you say a bit as well about this might be where the question about, you know, can I say, uh, you know, compare myself to Geico if I'm an if I'm an insurer? Uh, this is is this where trademark would come in where trademark law would come in? Yeah, absolutely. The trademark law does recognize that it's okay to use someone else's uh, brand name or brand imagery in your own advertisement, in your own communication materials, uh, if you do so fairly. It's a doctrine called the nominative fair use doctrine, where it recognizes that that you can use someone else's trademark if you do so fairly. And really, the, the touchstone of an, an unfair use or what would be an infringing use is if the use causes a likelihood of confusion. That's always the test you ask when you're dealing with trademarks. Is what I'm doing, is it likely to cause consumer confusion? Are people going to think that the competitor, the trademark that I'm using of the competitor, that they're the source of these materials or that I'm somehow affiliated with them or they endorse my services? If the use doesn't cause likelihood of confusion, it is, uh, it's generally permissible to use someone else's trademark. So you can say... Um, you know, here's how my services stack up to to some to someone else's, and you can you can comment on theirs uh, on their services, and you can tell some you can tell a little bit about your services or products as well. So the law does recognize that. The law also really encourages. Uh, there's some FTC guidelines and case law that recognizes this. They encourages comparative advertising. So compare me to my competitor, and to make that comparison, you do need to use. Uh, the other party's right. the other party's trademark to make right. that com- to make that comparison. But it sounds like the the bigger issue is that it is that piece about could it be confusing to so again if I said I'm better than Coca Cola and I put Coca Cola in big letters all over my website and my website has the red trademark colors and and, and all of that right that that's where that could become a problem. Absolutely, you you've identified the issue. It really goes to the prominence of of the use. And if it's it's if you're using your competitor's trademark in a very prominent manner, that certainly is more likely to cause confusion than sort of a textual use or something a narrative that you you know, you're Pepsi and you say compare my product to Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola just is in you know a normal font and without the red or the white lettering, that's less likely to cause confusion than when you have it very prominent in in your material. So prominence is a key, is, a, is definitely a key to this. Also, courts have they there is a preference for using the words you know, saying Nike as opposed to using the Nike swoosh. So words are preferred from a legal standpoint when you're making a comparison versus using someone else's logo. Logos are more likely to cause confusion 
at least some cases have, have held. And how about the actual claim itself? I mean, if I'm saying, you know, I'm cheaper and better uh, than such and such, you know, what do I need to think about if I'm making those claims? Absolutely. So any anytime you make a claim, uh, and that's what we call them sort of in the advertising world, uh, you, when you have an advertisement out there and it says something, it communicates a message to the to the viewer, uh, that's a claim. You have to have, well, well, one, it has to be it has to be truthful and it has to not be misleading. So something could still be truthful. Something could be truthful, but still be misleading. So it has to be truthful. Uh, it cannot be misleading. And there has to be substantiation for it. You actually have to have support for what you're saying in your advertisement. So if you say, I am cheaper than my competitor in terms of my pricing of my product, my pricing of my product is cheaper than my competitor, that actually has to be based in fact. And you have to, you have, to have investigated what you're competitor sells at. And you also have to be making a apples to apples comparison. You can't say I'm cheaper than my competitor, but you're, you're not comparing comparable products. That wouldn't be, well, that wouldn't be fair, fair either. So you have to have substantiation uh, before you make a claim in advertisement. And you can't just sort of assume that that's the case. And then someone challenges you and you and then you go and, and test your theory. Right. Even if your theory is right, you're sort of too late at that point. Um, the, the law requires that you have this prior substantiation. Before you say something, you have to have support for it. I know that uh, there is an exception to this, right? Yeah, there is uh, what's called puffery. And that's when we just, uh, and we see this all the time in advertising, when an advertiser says, I am the best. <laughs> right. Or, uh, yeah, our, our, our product is the best. That's, you know, typically the best restaurant, uh, you know, west of the Mississippi, those types of things. Those are uh, what we call puffery. And they're really just boastful statements of opinions that no one is intended to to rely on. They're, they're not going to be perceived as taken too seriously. So the law recognizes that we can, we can puff, we can, we can, we can have these sort of laudatory boastful statements and no one's really going to take them seriously. Seriously. They're just going to view them as, as, as opinion. So puffery does not need to be supported because there's really no way to support it. Right. I am the best. How, how is that measurable? But if you say something that's measurable, my product is cheaper than my competitor's product, that's actually measurable. That needs to be supported. Got it. How do you find, I mean, how effective is legal action, if it has to come to that, in stopping copyright and trademark infringement? It certainly can be uh, effective. Typically, copyright and trademark disputes are started with, with a letter with a business or a lawyer for the business reaching out to the other side and explaining their situation and asking that they stop uh, stop doing what they're, what they're doing. Uh, it's it's pretty rare in the copyright and trademark world for uh, a dispute to start with a lawsuit. Sometimes they advance to a lawsuit, but often um, disputes are resolved uh, prior to litigation and without without litigation. Now, to best protect yourself in those situations, it's, it's preferable, like we said, to have your trademark registration. So you can actually say, I own this trademark. And it's also preferable to have a copyright registration, though you don't need a copyright to have copyright. You actually do need a copyright registration to file a copyright lawsuit. So when you receive a letter from somebody and someone's saying, uh, you're infringing my copyright, if they don't include a copyright registration, I know they're not going to sue me because right. they don't have their copyright registration yet. Right. So just putting together um, a strong and persuasive communication to the other side and having your IP really in good shape before you, before you communicate it. So um, I guess today has been Joel Levitin from uh, Stinson Leonard Street. And uh, Joel, do you have any closing thoughts, you know, as we kind of wrap up here uh, about intellectual property, any closing thoughts for businesses to be thinking about? I guess I would say that, you know, IP ownership can really put a business at a competitive advantage. It can create new revenue streams. You can create something that might be valuable to the industry and you can create um, licensing revenue from that. So it's a way to monetize assets that maybe companies don't think about. And I guess with respect to trademarks, I would say much of our the products and services that are available in the world today, they're commodity products. There's not a lot of difference between product A and product B or service A and service B. And it's really the trademark that distinguishes those. You know, a shirt is a shirt, but if you put a specific logo on that shirt, all of a sudden that shirt can be sold for for more money. So your trademark really can be, and companies view trademarks really as some of their most valuable assets. Joel Levitin, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your, uh, this is really great information that you've shared, given us a lot to think about. 
when it comes to intellectual property. So thank you for joining me. You're welcome, Doug. Thank you. Direct your podcast questions to I ask at soyteam.com. Share this podcast with your friends and remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. As always, thanks for joining us. And please remember, we'll be answering this week's podcast questions at Spot on Insurance Facebook Live, Fridays at 11 a.m. Eastern. <laughs>